Chairman, I don't think the loudspeakers at the back here are working. Could arrange for. If we talk straight into the microphone, are they working at the back then? Yes. Yes. Okay. We just need to talk straight into the microphone. If that's all right, Susan. Okay. Is that on? Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Right. Okay. I'm Susan Brown. I'm chair of the Royal Society of Arts and then the Community on the Earth. I'll start with. Like that? Okay. I'll be swallowing it. <laughs> I don't think we can get here. Um, I'll be starting very negative, but ending very positive, so bear with me. Um, I live and work on the world. I'm a great uh, council taxpayer, and I feel I have a duty of care to the council employees that work for me and as our representatives as well. I've been asked to work with the libraries. I have never found uh, workforce that feels so undervalued as they do at the moment. Um, they find out on a Thursday where they're going to work the next week. Uh, this impacts both on their professional, their personal life, but also professional. If I go into a library and say, "Do you have a brochure stand?" They might say to me, well, "I haven't worked here for three weeks. I don't know everything's been changed around." It's also very difficult for them to interact with the public. Um, they um, can only, they're discouraged from taking any more than four consecutive days a week at any one time. That's very difficult as well. And my God, they're not allowed to be sick. 
I'm not getting the library service. They are working as hard as they possibly can with the limited resources they have. But that's where I was asked to come in and identify income streams for them. And there are many, many possibilities of income streams with the libraries right at the moment. But before we do this, we have to increase footfall. And so what I did was a quick survey of about 100 people to find out why they weren't using the libraries. And it's because they don't know that they're open. And that came as no surprise to the library staff at all. Um, if you think about it, we have computer suites, expensive equipment, everything else, and it's not being used because people don't know when they can come and use it. So how do we remedy this? Well, we've devised a troll train in conjunction with the World Festival of Firsts. They'll help with the advertising and help spread the festival and help spread the library hours throughout the borough. Trolls are part of our Viking heritage. No one knows what they look like, so they can be made of anything and they can be made to be look like anything. The trolls will be taken to the libraries. They have to find out when the opening hours are of the libraries between now and the 1st of June. Then I will pick them all up and see what we have and distribute them and place them in the libraries. Then there is a troll trail brochure so people can go around and find the trolls. Um, and then again, they have to find out the opening hours and then take the completed brochure to their library. Um, again, hopefully finding out the library hours of each library. There will be a prize. For them. Each library will have a prize for the uh, most completed brochure that they draw out. And then there is a prize for the best, the most beautiful, and the most horrible. Uh, Festival of Firsts have contributed all the funding for the printing that's being done. Cast Art in Liverpool have given us 24 prizes, and Oxton Books have given us the three book prizes for the three most beautiful, most horrible, and the best one. So I have a present for each of you. I have a troll chair leaflet and some salt dough so that you can make a troll and take it to your library. Um, I want you to while you're there, have a look at the building, inside and out. The library staff themselves, and many of the library staff friends groups as well, have a lot of ideas how they can increase income in the libraries. Even to the point that buildings are gorgeous, and there are a lot of meeting rooms and things. If we charge four pounds an hour for meeting room, 12 pounds a day for the times the library's open, most of the libraries open three days a week, you're talking about thousands of pounds over the time. If we hold art exhibitions and the libraries have taken commission, if we increase the footfall, they'll get income that way as well. We do need to do this. But you need to talk to them, please. The library staff have really good ideas, as do the friends. So I'll give you an excuse to go. You can tap some. If you each take a brochure and pass it on, I usually come up the center.
Okay, that's um, Father Leon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, On Monday, the uh, 23rd of April, St. George's Day, I've organised something for the centenary of the Zebruga occasion, the Zebruga raid, and that will be at Seacombe Ferry. This is for the advantage of the councillors to know. We'll be writing to the mayor as well. So Monday, the 23rd of April at 11 o'clock at Seacombe Ferry. Uh, I'd like to ask Caroline Lang how the artwork is going for the uh, sort of um, Crystal Palace type gable ends of Liscard Way, where the coats of arms have uh, either been bleached out or even taken away. And before uh, you answer, please, uh, Leander Road, the surface of the road I've mentioned before, is in a very bad state. And that, that's particularly on the uh, east side, I think it is. But uh, it's, a, it's a hazard for cyclists, the surface of the road. Councillor Abbey is not here to find out how things are progressing for uh, the bus stop at the corner of Belvedere Road and Wallasey Road that there should be bus stop on the surface of the carriageway. Thank you, Father Abbey. Um, I'm just going to pass over to Caroline now, so she'll give you updates and then she's going to go through the public questions. Uh, I'm pleased to report after many times that you've requested, Father Leon, that the artwork for the, what was the old Wallasey Crest has um, kindly been funded by Royal Chamber of Commerce through the Loveless Card work that's going on and they'll be replaced very, very shortly. The arches will be repainted. Um, and there'll be a little ceremony in this car to celebrate the, the start of future work to come. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> We've had a number of questions received online. Uh, there are quite a number, I'm afraid, so I will go through the questions and the answers that have been provided by officers to them. <coughs> the first question is from Mr. Heaton from Wallasey. How many dogs are allowed to be kept in a single dwelling and how long can they be left alone for? The replies come from Colin Clayton, who's our Senior Manager for Environmental Health and Trading Standards. There is no definitive answer as it will come down to the welfare needs being met for that particular dog and situation. Useful information from DEFRA, the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, Code of Practice for the welfare of dogs will be emailed to Mr Heaton. Any concerns about a dog's welfare should be reported to the RSPCA or World Council's environmental health team. Additionally, if the property is rented from a private or social landlord, there may be limitations on whether pets can live at the property or alternatively restrictions on the number and type. The next question is from Mr. Croston of Wallasey. What is happening to the vacant land in Wormsley <coughs> Street, Vermont? A surveyor has been taking measurements, what are they relevant to? And the answer is that planning permission was granted to Wirral Methodist Housing Association on the 22nd of February of this year for the construction of two semi-detached wheelchair accessible bungalows and the application reference will be emailed to Mr Croston. Next question is from Mr Ellis at Morton. Street lights in the car park next to Morton Library have not been working for months now. Is there any plan to have them repaired? There's a joint response from Paul Graves, who's our senior assistant engineer in street lighting, and Jeanette Royal, a senior manager in asset management. Repairs were undertaken on some of the lights recently, however, a number of these columns require full replacement. Any longer term replacement required will be incorporated into the regeneration activity <coughs> being undertaken by the Rural Growth Company. Next question from Mrs Mullen of Wallasey. I would like to see police presence on Liso Road for a time because of the now continual undertaking that has become dangerous on the road. This is happening at the traffic lights by Wallasey Village Station and by the junction of Bayswater <coughs> Road. It's frightening to see and there are a number of schools in the vicinity. Possibly a speed camera would help. And the answer from Inspector Harrison from Merseyside Police is that he's raised this issue with the school's officer for the area, Constable Kelly Atherton, and the local Lisa Morton team to review. And contact will be made with the questionnaire to discuss and progress this. 
Next question is from Mr McCracken of Wallasey. I filled an online questionnaire concerning the proposed change over our recycling system. I received a letter asking me to display a no to this system, which I have done. Why does the council want to spend £1.5 million on this, when it is obvious as soon as you step out of your front door, depending on where you live, that this money could be used to improve other areas? And the answer from Claire Brownwood, who's the team leader for waste prevention, is that the council carried out a thorough investigation into the potential changes to the waste collection system which are required for the council to meet the national 50% recycling target by 2020. At this time, a final decision is yet to be confirmed but we do not anticipate a service change in the near future. In the meantime, the council has implemented a new waste management plan to maximise the efficiency of our current collection systems and to help our residents to manage their waste correctly and recycle all that they can from the curbside. And Claire has provided some details about that plan, which will be included in the minutes and emailed to Mr. McCraft. Okay, I'll leave you there. Next question is from Mr. Dodd of Policy Village. Can something be done about the parking, abandoning of vehicles in Village Way during term time? They are causing hazards to services such as the refuse collection and access to emergency vehicles. At the end of the school day, parents totally disregard waiting and parking restriction signs and wait on pavements and block access to junctions, again causing access restrictions to all vehicles. A response has been given by Sergeant Mark Roberts from Merseyside Police. The local PCSO has been tasked to call into the school and ask them to put signs up to regarding double parking. It will also be ensured that staff are made aware of the issues and be visible during dropping off times. If they are clearly blocking junctions or park dangerously, then the police have the power to issue obstruction notices if appropriate. And Andy McCartan, who's the council's commissioning services manager, has added to that that our enforcement officers have visited this location and a request has been made for the yellow lines to be repainted on the highway. This should enable a more proactive enforcement of vehicles that are parked in contravention of the restrictions. It has been noted that the main occurrences are during a short period at the end of the school day. The next question is from Ms Stothard of Birkenhead. When will World Council stop spending public money on the felling of and dismemberment of trees across the borough and in all settings? Since 2011, many thousands of trees have been felled for no scientifically verifiable reason at enormous cost to the public. The rate at which, it, which this has happened is increasing year on year. Many have felled during the nesting season, which is Ill illegal under the Wildlife and Countryside Act. 20 plus healthy white poplars have begun site Piso, and all of the willows surrounding one of the Greasby ponds on Sorgal Massey Road are just two examples of multiple fellings. Parks and Countryside employs 150 plus persons and yet, and she names an officer, has pr proved unable and unwilling to meet with me and or justify this borough-wide policy. No investment is required to leave trees standing in the ground. So my question is, when will World Council stop committing public spending on this willful destruction instead of saving money, trees and our future at the same time? Unfortunately, due to annual leave, it's not been possible to obtain a response to that question. But as soon as the relevant officer is back, the response will be sent to Ms. Stothard and also published in the minutes as well. Um, the next question is from a Mr. O'Gorman, um, who noted on the online form that he'd like to ask that question himself. So I don't know if Mr. O'Gorman is here. No? Okay. Um, the question is mainly, I think, um, a statement about what he thinks the council should spend money on. But there is a question at the end of it, uh, which I will read, which is, uh, stop magenta and bamboo selling our houses, is it lawful? Mm -hmm. So I have a response from Magenta Living in relation to that question. And they provided an extract from one of their tenants' newsletters. Uh, where they stated that bamboo lettings was established in August 2016 following the government announcing, announcing a 1% rent reduction to housing association rents over a four year period. Magenta Living had to make savings of many millions of pounds to meet the government's rent reductions. 
In order to help fund existing services and build new affordable housing, we looked at other ways to bring income in to meet the shortfall. Bamboo Lessons is a joint venture company between Magenta Living and the <coughs> Helen's Warrington based housing association, Taurus Housing Group. Both organisations have similar issues with a drop in income, and by working together, we could share the costs of setting up the new venture. Bamboo's purpose is to let a small number of properties, less than 1% of our total stock, at market rent, as opposed to the social and affordable rents charged by Magenta Living. Any surplus that Bamboo makes is reinvested back into Magenta Living to support other activities and projects that we deliver, to ensure we focus on our, on our vision of providing homes and building communities where all can thrive. The properties let by Bamboo are for a period of up to five years, and the properties remain owned by Magenta Living during this time. The additional income will help subsidise Magenta Living's work. And then one final question, would you please to make from me to read, um, is from a Mr. Simpson of Grease Bay. Um, is Mr. Simpson here at all? Would you like to read your question? It's the one in relation to affordable homes and social housing, please. Yeah, I did put two questions in, as you probably know. Um, the second question was relating to the golf resource, and lo and behold, you want me to read the first question. Okay, the first question is, does Wallasey, Seek and Morton need affordable homes when the homeless and the people using food banks are crying out for social housing? Is this council once again ignoring the wishes of its residents? <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Simpson. I've had a response from Lisa Newman, who's the head of housing, so I'll, I'll read that out. Nationally, it is recognised that there is a shortage of affordable homes, and Wirral is no different, with some 2,200 people registered on the council's housing register with a priority need. There is need for affordable accommodation across a number of areas in the borough, and that includes Morton, Seacombe, and Wallasey. The Council works on a number of levels to deliver affordable housing for people who need it, including working with registered provider partners such as Magenta, Regenda, Borough Methodist Housing Association, etc. We do this by working together to secure funding from government and using our own local authority land assets to build on. The Leader of the Council also specifically set aside a programme of investment to target new build provision in areas including Seacom, Morton and Wallasey so they could benefit from affordable housing. Since 2011, 301 units of affordable homes have been built in these areas through the council and its partners working and investing together with a further 61 units currently on site and another approximately 150 in design stage, a demonstration of our commitment and recognition. In respect to food banks, we are aware by working in partnership with the food bank that many people who are using the service are not homeless, they have homes and are feeling the financial pressure due to a range of issues. In 2018 alone, we know that 49% of people referred into the service was because of needing help due to benefit changes and delays, increasing as a result of the rollout, the rollout of universal credit. 1% of those accessing the service were homeless, demonstrating that access to this service is wider than a homelessness issue. However, through programmes such as those highlighted, we are helping increase the provision of accommodation that is affordable for local people. What about social housing? You never mentioned that. So are we looking at social cleansing here? Yeah. Within the border, because social housing... Excuse, is excuse me, sir. Stop, sh excuse me, stop shouting. I'm not shouting. I'm not sure you can hear me. You've, you've had... Because your microphone system... You've had your answer. You've had your answer. Okay. okay, we've had a number of questions um, submitted in relation to the proposed golf resource in Hoy Lake. And in response, we want to direct people to the um, FA, FEQs available online. Okay, the link will be published in the minutes of this meeting, but for ease, there are a number of hard copies available to take away from the back of the room. So. I'm not sure what we want to do about these questions because there's a number of people here who can't answer questions um, about the golf resort because it's 
it's moved forward, it's got nothing to do with us as councillors from here on in, it's going to be a planning um, progress. So I, I can't understand, I don't know if you want us to read the questions so that we know what the questions are, but the answers will be printed online. So I'm happy for the questions to be read out, but we haven't got any answers for you here tonight. Do you want to read the questions? Caroline, sorry darling. Okay, the first question is from Mr Simpson of Reesby. Why does Royal Borough Council ignore the wishes of the majority to accommodate the few? I am talking of course about the closures within the constituency, that of Gertrude Court, the closure of Upton Fire Station and the removing of the night shift at Morsey Fire Station. The building of Hoy Lake Golf Resort, when so many people are against it, at a current rate of 15 to 1 against. <laughs> the impact of the new service road will have on Sorgal Massey. The borrowing and then loaning of 26 million to a flawed joint venture vehicle when shops in New Brighton, Wallace and other areas are closing. Would this money be better spent elsewhere to help the community? Why are Royal Council going against Labour Party policy and that of the local campaign forum? Do you think this is what we voted for? <laughs> the next question is from Mr McDonald of Liscard. Why is Royal Council lending money to a developer to fund a speculative housing golf course development on Greek Belt land? Could the money not be better used to fund local social care budgets? The next question from Ms Adamson of Sorgal Massey. In light of budget proposals, reduced services and staff, how can Royal Council justify borrowing £26 million to build a luxury housing complex and golf course, borrowing millions of pounds to other councils, and print a paper the vast majority of rural people have never seen. Yeah. Miss O'Rourke from West Kirby. New research by Newcastle University has found that urban areas could be more severely affected by climate change than previously thought. In some cases, the amount of water per flood could double. The properties are more already having regular flooding problems. Is it a good idea to be reducing the capacity of the Burkitt floodplain by building a golf resort and luxury housing estate on it? The next question from Ms. Cliff Upton. Wetlands are increasingly being seen as a sustainable way to manage flood risk. With climate change, Morton is likely to suffer even more flooding problems. So why is Royal Council refusing to fund a £10,000 feasibility study into a wild fowl and wetland centre? as an alternative to the Hoy Lake Golf Resort. Dr Jones of West Kirby, I'd like to ask what the effect of the proposed golf resort, Hoy Lake Golf Resort will be on the risks of flooding downstream of the Berkis as the floodplain will be affected. Also, whether there is a greater need for affordable housing in Solver, Massey, Morton and Wallasey than for high value housing in the West Wirral constituency. Ms. Stothard from Prenton, there's two parts to this question. First is, the CPRE has released a study into new roads that were justified on the basis that they would benefit the local economy. It has found that economic benefit was slower than expected, did not materialise at all, or was just as likely to suck money out of the local area as to bring it in. So why is the council proposing to spend 16 million on roads, straight from the motorway to the Hoylet Golf Resort, and what impact will it have on passing trade in Morton? Secondly, wetlands are increasingly being seen as a sustainable way to manage flood risk. With climate change, Morton is likely to suffer even more flooding problems. So why is Royal Council refusing to fund a £10,000 feasibility study into a wild, wild fowl and wetland centre as an alternative to the Hoy Lake Golf Resort? And then the final question is from Mr Barnes. This came directly into our engagement officer, so I don't know the gentleman's uh, town address. Properties in Morton have suffered repeated flooding because the surface water sewers are unable to discharge into the River Burkitt and Arrow Brook. Why is the council proposing to add to the problem by increasing flood flows discharging into these rivers from a place called resorts and housing estates built in the known flood zone? We've heard all the questions. We know that um, there's feasibility studies going on um, 
to do with the economic, to do with the environment, to do with all the other issues that may come up because of the, the golf course and that in time will end up in front of the planning committee. There's no officers here to answer them questions, there's nothing we can answer or say furthermore, but at least the questions have been heard and they've had a chance to voice them and you have, um, we've got somewhere to point you towards getting further answers. So, um, thank you very much for them questions. Is that, are there any other public questions? Are there any other questions? Apart from things to do with the golf course, because we don't have any more questions to do with the golf course, thank you very much. This gentleman here, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd just like to like, raise a local issue, a highway issue in uh, New Brighton. There's um, a passageway which joins the top of Atherton Street with St George's Park, uh, which is in a very poor condition. Um, it's a tarmac surface, it's right outside the um, St. Peter's and Paul School uh, and could do with some uh, attention. Um, can I raise one other issue? Again, highways, uh, again in the New Brighton area. Um, about two years ago now, there was a development of um, flats on the junction of Dudley Road and Albion Street. Um, as a result of that, there was a lot of damage caused to the pavement. Uh, the developer has carried out makes, makeshift repairs which leave the pavement looking like a checkerboard and has also left some uh, left a um, redundant vehicle crossing in which is to do with replacement. Uh, if uh, the council could look at that please. Okay, thank you, they're both noted and I'm sure that you're um, thank you, councillors. But we'll speak to you at the end. The gentleman behind. Thanks, Chair. Um, I'm Baron May, I'm from uh, New Brighton Ward, and I recently handed in a petition which contained 1,200 signatures against parking charges along the promenade in New Brighton. Now, we know that's passed through the Budget Council, and we know that's going forward, but the people who signed that petition would like now to know exactly when that will be implemented, how much money will be raised from that, how that money will be used and when will there be any consultation with the local residents that will be affected by these parking charges and the overflow that will cause? Um, if you want to catch up with them afterwards, <coughs> Pat will come and talk to you directly afterwards. Okay, and I think there was another there was a lady at the back who said you wanted to ask a question. Yes, please. Well, please don't ask me to sit down because I feel this is very important. We know there's a direct correlation between pollution, heart disease, asthma, cardiovascular disease, stroke, emphysema. Recent research has identified a correlation between Alzheimer's disease and high levels of pollution. Some 10,000 vehicles cross Salford Mass and Bypass each week. We have one of the worst pollution areas in and around Birkenhead and its environs. People's Life expectancy is tragically 10 years lower than those living in more salubrious areas. Bill Brother and Wanted Golf Course on a beautiful wet plain in Boyley are not only to give rise to flooding, unmitigated destruct, destruction, destruction, but the people of Hoyley, Mells, Upton, Sargon Massey, and Morton will also see their health suffer and the quality of their lives diminish and the lifespan group months finally. Mr Davis and his planning committee are they totally indifferent to the health and needs of the people they purport to serve? Have they given a single thought to the impact their actions will have, not only on this generation but future generations? Are they prepared to bury the people of world under a burden of death of unspeakable magnitude? while destroying their health and future, not of this generation, but of future generations. Thank you very much for all your questions. Shall we move on to the next item on the agenda, please? Okay. Community represents.
tonight. Um, I haven't had a chance to meet with Sarah, and we've not really been in touch since the last meeting, so we've not really done a lot. But in my other job as um, at the Development Trust, we've been going out to communities doing community organising training, and we've seen a real shift in local communities getting involved in things. Um, the 106 bus was, was an example of community power, and as part of the door knocking, they are trying to engage people in the constituency, so I can report back more next time. Thank you very much. I know how important the community door knocks have been and what a massive um, effect it's had on public and, and, and finding people who needed our help. So I thank anybody who does anything to do with the, the door knock. Okay. Can we, uh, we're all together working with our local communities. So is Rachel here? Oh, no, I didn't see you. There we go. Can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you for having me, Chairman, and the rest of the committee this evening. Um, I'm standing in tonight for Councillor Matthew Patrick to feedback and test out some of the work that we've been doing um, over the last few months, looking at how we better work with our local communities. So I'm going to um, make a presentation tonight that feeds some of that work back to you. Um, so why this is important, so um, Council Patrick commissioned this piece of work um, in response to the good evidence that shows that by working with local people, um, organisations can get better outcomes for local people and can achieve greater value for money for the public purse. Um, and I think most significantly you'll see that when um, we conducted our resident survey in 2015, over half of our local residents did not feel that they could influence the decisions affecting their areas. So, can we turn the lights off because we've been able to see the slides. Thanks. 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 Work because of the limitations and the capacity that we had 
on the core budget expenditure. So that's the £50,000 each committee is allocated each year. And we looked at this expenditure since the committees have been set up in 2013 to the period that we were undertaking the work. And you can see there that just over half a million pounds has been spent um, across Wirral and there's varying um, amounts of projects that occurred. And I do need to explain that the, the variation in the scale of those projects relates to the different investment models that exist across each of the constituencies. So to give you a feel for that, you'll see West Wirral has 191 projects up there. That's because they operate small um, investment projects under £1,000. Um, in contrast, you look at Birkenhead and Wirral South, where they tended to either focus on one particular priority and spend small amounts of money on those, or commissioned single pieces of work around a specific project. And similarly, I think it's fair to say in your committee, you've probably had a mixture of the two. So again, it was quite a difficult exercise to do a bit of a compare and contrast, but it did produce some interesting findings, I think. Um, in, across the board, all the investors, in, investments reflected the local priorities identified in the resident survey for each local area. Um, and positively, we got a, a, a good return on investment. So, um, that's an average amount. So for every one pound spent on these projects, we would get a two pound sixty eight uh, return. Now again, that would vary depending on the project. So in some of the projects, that might increase to eight pounds per pound spent. Um, and finally, there were some recommendations from that report in terms of continuing to ensure we're evaluating the projects, um, being clear on when we actually look to sustain those projects centrally. Thanks, Carolina. And just for your benefit, because it was some of the feedback I'd had from um, councillors around the table, just to give you an indication of how that looks, and I know this, this text is very small, but we'll circulate this so you can have a look. You can see how that expenditure pans out across um, each of the constituencies and what that looks like. Thanks, Caroline. And finally, the final piece of work, and really, I suppose, um, the most interesting piece of work, was... Um, the work that we did talking to a range of people and that was through individual interviews with people, focus groups, surveys, workshops. We used a range of methodologies to undertake this and um, it's quite a huge piece of work as you can imagine but this summarises some of the key findings from that. So you all around the table and probably people in the audience won't be surprised to hear that you know there was a very strong consensus that when communities worked with organisations um, it was highly valued and felt to be much more effective. And some of the particular examples cited there were some of the um, projects that are ongoing across Wirral, so some of these people will be familiar with. So um, the Improving Life Chances projects that are operating in Birkenhead and Rockbury and Seacombe, Eastern Connects, Litter Picks, Door Knocks, um, those kind of activities were seen to be particularly useful for engaging with communities in terms of getting action delivered, but also providing an opportunity to, to talk to residents. Um, again, you won't be surprised, and I'm saying that as somebody born and bred in Wirral, our communities are very diverse and have varying assets, needs and interests. So there was a strong sense that, again, one size would not fit all. Um, but uh, on the flip side, um, I think there was a consensus view that there were opportunities for um, having discussions with local residents through the existing community networks and engagement through action instead of formalised meetings. So you can see here that um, for, for a large number of the respondents across those range of people that we spoke to, the formal committee setting was not considered to be the right forum for engaging with local people for a, a, a variety of reasons. Um, the small grant and seed funding was reported particularly by local communities as enabling that action to take place. So letting people be able to get on with doing stuff. So give us some money, we can get a skin, we can buy some equipment for lizard pigs, it actually makes things happen. Um, and similarly, support for community groups to leverage more.